This is NASA TV. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's final briefing on the upcoming Crew-1 mission. This will be the first operational flight with astronauts aboard the Crew Dragon spacecraft and Falcon 9 rocket to the International Space Station. We are excited to be joined by the astronauts of that mission. NASA astronauts Shannon Walker, Victor Glover, Mike Hopkins, and Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Soichi Noguchi. They are scheduled to launch on October 31st. Shannon Walker is the mission specialist for Crew-1. Shannon was selected as an astronaut in 2004. She launched to the International Space Station aboard a Russian Soyuz spacecraft and spent 161 days in space in 2010. Shannon is a Houston native and has a PhD in space physics. Next, we have Victor Glover. Victor is the pilot of the Crew Dragon spacecraft and second in command for the mission. He was selected as an astronaut in 2013, and this will be his first space flight. He's a California native and holds degrees in flight test engineering, systems engineering, and military operational art and science. He is a naval aviator, a commander in the U.S. Navy, and was a test pilot in the U.S. Navy. Next, Mike Hopkins is the commander of the Crew Dragon spacecraft and Crew-1 mission. He was selected as, as an astronaut in 2009 and spent 166 days aboard the space station during expeditions 37 and 38. Mike grew up on a farm outside Richland, Missouri, has degrees in aerospace engineering, and is a colonel in the U.S. Air Force. Finally, Soichi Noguchi will also be a mis mission specialist for Crew-1. He was selected as an astronaut candidate in 1996 and is a veteran of two space flights. He launched on the Space Shuttle Discovery for STS-114 return to flight in 2005 and aboard a Soyuz spacecraft in 2009. The Crew Dragon will be the third spacecraft that Suichi has flown to the space station on. Now we'll hear brief remarks from the crew and then we'll take questions. On the phone, please press star one to ask a question and star two to withdraw a question. You can also ask questions on social media using the hashtag AskNASA. Mike, over to you for some remarks. Thanks, Megan. Uh, first, I just wanna thank everyone that's joining us today. And I, I'd like to just start off with a few thoughts. Uh, first, uh, crew one is ready. Uh, you know, we didn't become a full crew until actually uh, late February, early March. And, uh, and, and since that time, the crew and the entire training team has done an amazing job of, of getting us ready and, and to this point. Uh, it certainly helps when you, when you uh, have a short timeline like this that you add experienced crew members and, and certainly uh, Suichi and Shannon, uh, they fall into that, into that category. Uh, so I'm very excited to be sitting here next to Victor, Shannon, and, and Suichi. We've had a lot of fun in our training. And, uh, and not only are they uh, great astronauts, but they're, they're also great people. Uh, second, I'd, I'd like to thank our families. Uh, space flight, training for space flight can be uh, very difficult, challenging uh, for, for the families. And this year has, uh, has added a few extra challenges, if you will. And our families have, have done a great job. Um, they've been uh, very supportive throughout all of this. And so I think all of us are very grateful to get to share this experience with, with our families. Uh, third, you heard Megan mention that our, our launch is now on the uh, 31st of October, and so that is a, a slip of a little over a week since uh, from the 23rd of October. Uh, you know, the crew actually doesn't have a lot of control over the launch dates, uh, but what we do have a control on is, is our readiness. And so we're going to uh, work very closely with our training team, with our, with our leadership team, and, and make sure uh, we're maintaining our readiness uh, as, we, as we work through these slips to, to the launch date. And then finally, I just wanted to, uh, to say thank you. Thank you to all of the people at SpaceX, uh, at NASA, around this country and around the world that have helped us get to this point. It's, it is very exciting to be a, a part of a new era in the human spaceflight program where uh, we're using commercial companies now to get us to the International Space Station. I think for all of us, we feel uh, very privileged and very humble to, uh, to play a small part in that. Victor? Yeah. And before we get started, I just wanted to briefly just also express some gratitude. I want to thank God for getting us to this point. I want to thank my family for their love and support and for all of the NASA and SpaceX folks and to our partners all over the globe that have gotten us to this point uh, 
amidst this global pandemic. Uh, thank you so much for, for all that you've done. With that, I'll hand it off to Suichi. Thank you. I, I'm very happy to be here as a part of this wonderful crew uh, for this SpaceX inaugural flight for the operation uh, to the International Space Station. And uh, my, my hats off to the, all the NASA team and JAXA team and the SpaceX team to make this uh, mission successful. え、日本の皆さんこんにちは。え、ジャクソンのみそうちです。このえ、素晴らしいミッション、スペース X の第1号にえ、この素晴らしいクルーと共に飛べることをとても楽しみにしています。That's it。シャノン、テケロエ。
and so we recognize that it is a certified vehicle, but we also recognize that there's going to be some new features. And I'll let Ike talk about some of those new capabilities that we will potentially be demonstrating while we're on board. Absolutely. So our vehicle has new hardware. Uh, for example, we are a little more robust to uh, the loads at splashdown. We also have new software that enables us to undock from one docking port, say the forward docking port, and then reposition to the Zenith, the one that's on top. Um, we also have floor crew, as Mike mentioned earlier. All of those things are, are features that we will be exercising for the first time. Um, but also, um, the... The, the way the administrator put it when he was asked that the, the Bob and Doug's mission was the developmental test mission. Our mission is like an operational test mission. So as soon as we hit day 64, that's going to be the first time a Crew Dragon at the space station has reached that milestone. And then every day after that will be, will be new territory. Question, let's go to Lauren Grush with The Verge. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, this, my question is for the American astronauts. Uh, you're currently slated to fly right before a very big election, and uh, your fellow astronaut Kate Rubin says she plans to vote from space. I'm curious if you'll be doing the same or if you will be early voting, just in case. <laughs> Um, I, all of us are planning on voting from space. Uh, NASA works very well with the different election um, uh, organizations because we're all voting in different from different counties but uh, it was easiest for us just to say we were going to vote for space so that's what we're going to do all right let's go to Michael Sheets with CNBC hi all I, you all come from very very different backgrounds both in terms of your experiences uh, with space flight uh, some you know Victor is your first uh, Nuguchi is your your third I'm curious, as you guys have gotten to gel as a team, what, what is that experience like uh, getting to know one, one another in the last few months as well as uh, wrapping up your training together? You know, I'll, I'll start off with that, um, and, and then maybe I'll let the, uh, the guy that's uh, getting ready for his third space flight add to it. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it, that has been what's made this, this crew, I think, uh, so special. Uh, you know, you look at Victor, and, and yeah, this is his first flight, but he brings a wealth of experience, operational experience with the Navy to the table. And, and so, uh, you know, it doesn't matter that he's uh, is a rookie from spaceflight perspective. He, he um, just contributes all the time, and, and I really rely on his advice. Uh, you know, Shannon has, has flown before. She's been around NASA for, uh, for quite a while here at Johnson Space Center. <laughs> and it's the same kind of thing, right, uh, that, that uh, bringing that experience to the table. Uh, both she and Suichi have trained as a left seat flyer on the Soyuz. And so even though in this particular capsule um, they don't have access to all of the controls, all the displays like Victor and I do, uh, we still take advantage of their experience, of their advice. Of the, you know, Sometimes they're sitting there and they see things um, that, that Victor and I may not see because we're, we're busy on the displays. And so uh, the, the opportunity to, to take advantage of that experience um, has, has really been helpful. And then, you know, the last thing I would say um, is that, you know, one of the advantages, I think, of, of this pandemic and how we've been training is when we go out to, to SpaceX, for example, and train out there, we have been together um, for, for 24 hours a day. And, uh, and that gives you... <laughs> They're, they're laughing, but that gives you an opportunity um, to get to know each other outside of the workplace, too. And so we've shared a lot of nights sitting around the dinner table and, and talking about uh, things other than space flight, and, and that's been very helpful as well. Yeah. So, Rich, I don't know if you want to add anything in terms of uh, your third space flight. And yeah, actually, uh, you know, for this uh, training flow, uh, both uh, Hopper and Ike started like two years ago. So they, they know the SpaceX system inside out. And uh, Shana and I joined like last uh, February, or March, so it's relatively short. But uh, the, the important thing is all of us uh, kind of contribute to this wonderful team. Everybody is bringing something to the table. And uh, Shana and I have the uh, uh, luxury of uh, flying and, and Soyuz and Hopper as well. And also cherish uh, Ike's uh, test pilot background. We really expect mm -hmm. his uh, input. So all of us, this diversity definitely brings uh, the team's uh, resilience as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the one for all, all for one. That's come from Shannon. <laughs> but definitely the four of us contributed to the wonderful team of this group one. 
You know, and if I could add one little short thing, we have, I think, captured the best of the training from the Soyuz uh, training flow and, the, and the, the shuttle flow where you had a bigger crew. And, and to really see the best of both worlds, I think, is it, made it special. And we have a, a ton of fun training together. Awesome. Okay, let's go to Bill Harwood with CBS News. Hey, thank you. This is for Shannon. Would you, uh, we've heard this in earlier briefings, but from the crew, talk about the value of having at least four uh, USOS crew members on board the ISS at the same time in terms of increasing scientific productivity. How big of a milestone uh, is that to the research community? And then a second really quick question, can someone explain Ike's nickname? Thanks. Well, we'll let Ike explain his nickname. Um, but in terms of having more people on the station, so by the time we get up there, Kate will already be there. So we'll have five uh, people on the USOS side, as, as uh, we call our half of the space station. And so it is huge, the amount of research that we can get done and the science that we can get done with just uh, one or two more people is, is more than just one or two more people's worth of, of science. And you also have the luxury of a regular sized crew, say a crew of three, which may only be two USOS or three USOS people, uh, still work on science while you're doing other things with the space station, be it maintenance or, or other items that need to be taken care of. And so the ability for us to accomplish whatever needs to be accomplished goes way high with more people on the station. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's an acronym. It stands for I Know Everything. And the short story is it is a reminder to never pass up an opportunity to keep my mouth shut. And I'll start now. <laughs> hey, he knows everything by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. All right, let's go on to David Curley with Discovery Channel. Thanks for taking the call, everybody. Uh, to Mike and uh, Victor, Mike, go Mustangs. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the issue with the heat shield and the tiles, and are you comfortable with the fix that everyone else seems to be comfortable with? Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Um, so actually, the, all four of us have, have been uh, following very closely the, the issues with the, the heat shield that were discovered during the, the DM2 mission. Uh, and, and again, we've We've hit on this earlier, but I would say this is another example of why the experience that we bring to this uh, this crew, um, and and not I can I in this particular case, but you know Suichi was on the the return to flight shuttle mission after after Columbia. Shannon's husband was was on that mission as well, and and so they have brought um, a, a lot to the table, um, having lived through that uh, after after Columbia. So I would. I would say yes, we are following it very closely, um, but I would also say uh, there is a, an amazing team that has been brought together to work this issue, and we are confident in this team and, and their ability to find the, the right solutions. Yeah. Thanks. Let's go to Marina Corin with The Atlantic. Um, so there's a sense of ceremony around breakfast on launch day and a public interest in that tradition that goes back to the Apollo days. Have you thought yet about what you'd like to eat for breakfast that day, which I guess now is actually going to be more of a midnight snack? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that's a good idea. <laughs> you know, actually, we, we had a, one of our first meetings today just on what that schedule was going to look like, and so a lot of those little details uh, in, in terms of what we're going to eat and, and uh, when uh, we're going to have that meal, uh, we're, still, we're still working through those, but uh, um, I have no doubt that we're going to be well-fed. Uh, the team down at, at uh, KSC, in fact, actually the team here at Johnson Space Center, because we'll go into a quarantine period, uh, before we leave and even leave for the Cape, and and so uh, the the meals that we'll have here and the meals that we'll have down there, I, I know are going to be absolutely fantastic. One thing I can quickly add is, uh, like earlier mentioned, we are take, taking the good uh, piece from the shuttle side and the uh, Russian Soyuz side. We're picking the, the good uh, tradition. Uh, the breakfast is one thing. We're starting to talk about the, the, uh, the last final two weeks uh, on the ground, and we're starting to pick some of the good uh, tradition we like from the Soyuz side, and we're trying to keep the uh, other uh, good side from the shuttle side. So we can enjoy the, the best side of those two wars, and uh, we can start a new transition. Awesome. Okay, let's go to Miriam, Miriam Kramer with Axios. Hi, thanks so much. 
Uh, so my question is for the three American astronauts. Uh, so y'all are flying to space at a somewhat fraught time with the ongoing pandemic and protests around the country, like you mentioned, Mike. Um, and I'm curious what you, you all see as your role as astronauts within that broader context. Thanks very much. Uh, I'll start. I mean, I think, I, think, uh, I, I think what we can show or demonstrate, actually all four of us, is uh, just the, the unity and and the fact that it doesn't matter uh, what background you come from, but when you all work together, uh, again, as I mentioned, not only in the name of resilience, but when you all come together, you can, uh, you can do some amazing things. And so I, I do find it interesting, you know, we've all started at different places uh, across this country. We've all had um, slightly different uh, paths that have taken us here, but when you really look at them, uh, there's, there's a lot of similarities there uh, as well. So. Um, I, I think we, we do bring a lot to the table, and, and, the, and the four of us actually together is, uh, is a much stronger product in the end. All right, let's go to Selen Barber with Gannett Publications. Mike, this is a question for you. How excited are you to have this honor of not only returning to space, but being the commander of this historic mission, launching from the bird? launch pad 39a and then also follow up how has your training you know changed from your previous mission thank you yeah thanks so enough you know the as a, a commander as you can imagine it, it's quite an honor um you know as a as a flight test engineer as a um as a backseater if you will in the aviation world i i, I don't have that opportunity to command um i think uh that that uh, these new vehicles uh, moving forward, they, they show the opportunities that are out there um, for for other folks um, that, that don't necessarily have the same background as, say, Victor in this particular case. Um, so so it, is, it is an honor and I'm humbled by it, but I will also tell you that um, there is a lot of value in the experience, for example, that Victor brings to the table with all of his operational hours in the, uh, the F-18 with, with the Navy. And, and so I certainly don't want to underplay that. Um, and I also want to say that I have taken advantage of that. And I mentioned it earlier as well, you know, both Shannon and Suichi have trained as a, as a left seater um, in the Soyuz, which means they were second in command. They, they uh, would have been called on to take command. And so it's, it's kind of funny, I'm sitting here as the commander, but in reality, I probably have the least experience of, of any of these three in terms of being a, a commander. And so I have, uh, I've relied very heavily on them uh, throughout this training training flow, and I'm going to continue to rely on them as as we uh, go uphill and and get on board the International Space Station. So, uh, I, I think I forgot what the the second part of the question was, but um, you know, I, the the differences. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you, Victor. I see what I mean. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, the differences. Uh, clearly, there there has been a um, uh, a lot of big differences. Uh, uh, between training over in Russia, you know, some of them are are logistics uh, associated. You know, when you go over and train in Russia, you're going for three, four, five, six weeks at a time uh, before you get to come home. Whereas here, uh, we go out to SpaceX, we spend uh, a week in Hawthorne, and then we get to come home and be with our families on on the weekends. And and so I can't say enough about the you know how that um, that piece is. Uh, it's nice. It's nice to be able to see your family, your loved ones on, on the weekends. And, and so hats go off to our, our colleagues and our crewmates that are continuing to to go through the Russian uh, training flow because uh, it does present a, a few more challenges associated with it. Uh, the other thing I would say um, that's a little bit different is this is new. Um, the the Soyuz is a well proven program, and the training program is the same. You know the crews have been going through that, and I would say. Uh, one of the things that I remember, uh, one of my um, our fellow astronauts, uh, Joe Acaba, before my last flight on the Soyuz, um, as I was getting ready to go over for the final fall exams and all of that, I didn't feel like I was ready. And, and I uh, mentioned this to Joe, and he said, Mike, trust the system. By the time you're ready to launch, uh, you're going to be ready. Uh, we didn't. Uh, fortunate enough to experience three different uh, spacecraft training. Uh, this one, obviously, most of the training uh, for the Crew, Tra Crew Dragon side is done by SpaceX itself. And their approach is uh, slightly different, but I would say it is really effective. 
And uh, as I told you earlier, we have, uh, the Shan and I have like a very condensed flow, about six months uh, from the scratch to the launch pad. <laughs> and actually it worked out great. And uh, again, this is our four of us uh, joined together to come up with the right way of operating the spacecraft. Mm -hmm. So it's not just SpaceX, SpaceX is great. But uh, we also, as a team, come up with the right approach. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure that, though, uh, like, like my commander said, we are ready to fly. All right. From Jackie on Facebook, what would you say to an aspiring astronaut? You know, I think uh, the three things I generally say when I get the, the privilege to go talk to young folks is to be gritty, G-R-I-T-T-Y. It means to, to persevere and to not be afraid to work hard, to be a lifelong learner inside and outside the classroom, and to, to uh, work very hard at being a good teammate. And that last one is very tough because at the end of the day, it's not up to you. It's up to the people to your left and to your right. So to be gritty, to be a lifelong learner, and to be a good teammate. All right from LA and Berger on Twitter. How comfortable do you all feel in the mock-ups of the capsule being four people inside? <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. No, I, mean, got it. I, I think it's very comfortable compared to the Swiss, which has three. Um, it's a much tighter space where you're actually sitting. Uh, the Soyuz does have another compartment where it has stowage. In the uh, Crew Dragon, it's just one compartment, so your stowage and your people are all together. But it makes it feel a little more space-ish. Space, space space-ish. Space-ish. It's hard to say. Um, but it's nice. It's comfortable. All right. Let's go back to the phone bridge for some more media questions. Robert Perlman with Collect Space. Hi, thank you. Um, for all four of you, what does the milestone of reaching 20 years of continuous human occupancy on the ISS mean to you each personally? And what does it say about the overall state of human space exploration when you consider that over the last two decades and 240 people, there have been less than two dozen women, less than 20 people who were from countries other than the U.S. and Russia, and only now with Victor, you're becoming the first African-American astronaut to become a space station expedition crew member. Well, I'll start. The ability to fly in space period is a privilege, and so to be able to fly on this amazing vehicle that was made in California like I was, that is a privilege. It is icing on the cake. To be able to live on the space station for six months and, and during that time to, to, to be there for the 20th anniversary of, of human presence on that station and to potentially launch on the 20th anniversary of the launch of Expedition 1 is just special and, and uh, relates to something Mike said earlier, that you know, the power of teamwork, when we come together to work on the same thing, that there's no limit to what we can accomplish. It, it is truly a privilege. All right, now let's go to Chelsea Gold with space.com. Good afternoon. Um, so kind of on a, on a similar note, uh, this is a question for Victor. As Robert mentioned, you will be the first black astronaut to ever be part of a crew for a long duration mission on the space station. Um, this seems like a long time coming, and I'm curious, as also a first-time astronaut, how you feel about embarking on your first mission while also making this history? Well, I actually try very hard not to think a lot about it. I want to go up there and I want to do my job very well, and, and I want to come back and talk to you about that after I get back home to my family safely. So I would say let us accomplish that first, and then we have something to celebrate. It's bittersweet, and I can't tell you why it's taken us this long, but, uh, again, I hope to go up there and do my job to the best of my ability, and, and I would love to come back and tell you stories afterward. All right, let's go to Joey Roulette with Reuters. Hey, uh, I was wondering what the process of casting a ballot from space is like. Do you uh, guys send some kind of digital ballot down to Houston? Um, and also, would love to hear any kind of good tips that you guys could share from Bob and Doug that they may have passed along from their mission. Thanks so much. Well, I, I can talk about casting a ballot from space since I did it last time I was on the space station. Oh. Um, they basically send you an electronic uh, file it's a PDF, and you mark your choices, and then you email it back to the, um, oh, I forget the title of the person, but the person who's in charge of the uh, election for the county. And so then that gets counted into uh, all the ballots that are, are brought back. It's very simple, very straightforward. 
And, and then I'll uh, jump in in terms of uh, from Bob and Doug. Uh, we were very fortunate after they got on orbit, probably about a week after, I think, we had a chance to, to have a conference with them. Um, and then once they returned to Earth, uh, the same thing. Uh, we had an opportunity to speak with them. And, and one of the, the great things about that is uh, you get to hear sometimes the little details that, that don't show up in a training, uh, training program or a training lesson. And some of those things are simple. Some of those may not seem like a lot, but they can be very important. For example, they talked a lot about some of the sounds that occurred during the uh, fueling process. You know, this is something that uh, we haven't done um, in the past. And so having, having astronauts in the capsule on the rocket as you're fueling it up is, is a little bit different. And so listening to them uh, describe some of those sounds is very helpful because then when we hear them, uh, during that process, uh, you're expecting it, and, and it's not as big of a surprise, and you're not sitting there looking at each other was, or, you know, were we supposed to hear that? Uh, the other thing is not just the sounds, but the feelings, and, and so they talked a little bit about that, and when I say feelings, I mean what the vehicle is doing. You're feeling the vehicle as it's coming in the atmosphere, for example, and, and they described a little bit about that, and, and again, it helps set those expectations and, uh, and, and helps you prepare uh, for, those, for those events. All right, let's go to Paul Rivera with West 2 News, NBC. Hey, thanks for taking my call, uh, my questions. This is to everyone. When it comes to the diversity of the crew, and this sort of pegs off of an earlier question, how important is this diversity of the crew to future space explorers that look to you and say, this person is in these shoes doing this, I might be able to do this moving forward because they took that step? Yeah, I, I think your question actually is, is a great uh, answer a, as well. Um, you know, I think that is one of the nice things about this crew is, uh, is people out there can, can take a look at it and, and find something f similar, um, uh, familiar to them. And, and uh, we hope that that can be an inspiration to them. Uh, but I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, and, I would, and I'm, I'll mention it again. When you really look at our backgrounds, uh, there's a lot of similarities there. And, and so, um, you know, I just... I, you know, focusing on those similarities, I think, is, is, is pretty important as well, but also celebrating um, our differences and, and hoping that uh, that can inspire folks from all across uh, the country and the world, I, I think, is a great thing. All right, let's go to Gina Sanceri with ABC News. Shannon, you've got considerable experience already on the space station. What are you bringing forward from your last segment to your last expedition to this that will make this expedition different for you? That's a, that's a good question. I haven't thought too much about that. I think one of the things that I will bring is my experience, which doesn't sound like a very concrete answer, but my experience of having already lived and worked there will give me a huge head start and make me much more efficient this time around than I was uh, last time I flew. So um, knowing how the station is laid out, knowing how it's packed, knowing how the ground works with the crew on the station, um, how it all fits together will make me just a better crew member overall. Okay, let's go to Dave Mosher with Business Insider. Hi, all. I uh, kind of want to spring off an earlier question, um, and this is for anyone who's most excited to answer it. What is the, the most interesting comment or tip that Bob or Doug told you about riding the Dragon? And, and I mean that in terms of preparing you for the mission. I think, Mike, you mentioned the sounds, but maybe there's something else that they said that has really stuck with you, and, and you can share with us what, what that is. Thank you. Yeah, I've got I've got one that I'll share, and if, if somebody else has one as well, uh, I hope they, they have an opportunity to share that too. But um, I would say um, I remember talking to to Doug about entry, and um, his comment about entry was that it, it happens fast uh, from the time the the um, do orbit sequence starts, the entry sequence starts to to when you touch down is is very fast. And so his his comment was. Um, even though it's happening fast, he said he felt like he was ahead of the vehicle. And, and so uh, for, for people uh, in the aviation world or flying world like this, that, that has a certain meaning to it. And, and that, uh, it, for me, that means I need to make sure um, that we as a crew are, are ready for that moment because, again, when things happen fast, you need to, to uh, be anticipating and, and be ready to go. And so that, that really stood out to me. 
Yeah. And another thing that they mentioned was uh, that after their manual piloting demo that the vehicle flew like the sim. Mm. And that is, is comforting and it is also a testament to SpaceX and, and the product that they've created. Yeah. Okay, let's go to Meredith Garofalo with Weather Nation. Thank you guys all so much. I really appreciate your time. Now, we've had decades of different accomplishments of space exploration, and why is this one important to you and for our future generations? What do you hope they always remember from this launch and from this mission? Wow. That's a tough one. So I, I would hope that uh, coming out of this is, uh, I, I mentioned it earlier as well, that it's kind of the start of a new era in, in human spaceflight. Um, I, I think in terms of you know, using the commercial companies to give us access to the International Space Station. I think there's another piece that's happening, and that is opening up low Earth orbit to more people, um, to uh, potentially not just NASA um, astronauts and, and JAXA astronauts and cosmonauts, uh, but uh, to, to uh, civilians that are out there. And, and so I think um, if this is the start of that, I, I think that's a, a great thing, and I hope they can take that from it. All right, let's go to Stephen Clark with Space Flight Now. Hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering which of you um, are training or which of you would be expected to go outside for an EVA, at least which, which of you received the EVA training. And uh, I, I understand your EVA training is complete, your drive-in training at SpaceX is complete. So what are your schedules like over the next month leading up to launch? Do you have additional sims or are you going to take that extra week to do some more training? And what else are you doing to prepare for the mission? Thank you. I'll start with the EVA piece. Um, so in terms of uh, training for EVA, actually all four of us are, are trained for EVA. In terms of going out the door, uh, Victor, uh, myself, and, and Suichi will go out the door. But, and Kate. Uh, and Kate. Kate, thank you. Um, but then Shannon has, I would actually say, probably the more difficult role, and that's uh, getting us out the door. Uh, that is a very compressed timeline. Uh, there's a lot going on, a lot of different procedures that have to be tracked, and, uh, and it's critical. And, and so um, all four of us, uh, in terms of uh, including Kate, are, are prepared to go out the door, and, uh, and Shannon is just as important part of that, of that role in terms of uh, making the EVAs happen. Um, and in terms of what we're going to be doing, I don't know if anybody else wants to, to chime in on that one. We do a little bit of refresher training. Our, our, the bulk of our training is complete, but there will probably be a sim or two in there to make sure that our skills are tip-top when we're ready to go. But we do also get the opportunity to take some time off. And so we'll have about a week where we can um, spend time with our families and wrap things up at home before we go away that's going our time on orbits, um, you know, across a major holiday season, we'll be home after tax season. There may be things that we need to take care of before we go. Yeah, taxes. You know, you're right. <laughs> um, and then, and then we'll be right into quarantine, um, getting ready to go. All right, let's go to Frida Juarez with El Universal. Hi, everybody. Thank you for taking my question. I was wondering. Uh, this one is for everybody. How does the pandemic change your perspective from space and your perspective about being an astronaut? Well, can I say that it, I was joking in describing this time with my family that, you know, they get to experience a little bit what it's going to be like to live on the space station with the, the increase in isolation and, and having to find new ways to communicate virtually, doing their schoolwork. Our kids are doing schoolwork online. And so I think that's one, you know, like maybe a positive spin you could put on this is the, the entire planet is in one way or another experiencing, you know, the austerity that, that comes with living on the International Space Station. Um, but I will also say that the perspective piece for me, it has given me an, a greater sense of respect for, for the people that have had to go out and continue to keep our communities clean, the folks that are picking up the trash and making sure that our facilities are clean, and the folks that have to continue to come in and help us to train and be ready for this mission, and that created and, and built this vehicle or are still building this vehicle. And so I, I thought I was already grateful, but I am, I am increasingly grateful for all of their hard work. All right, Irene Klotz with Aviation Week. Thanks. Uh, this is for uh, Mike or uh, Victor or Shannon. Uh, you know, NASA has gone through this route of trying to open up LEO previously and shortly after shuttle started flying with flying politicians and school teacher and so forth, and we know how that worked out. 
What do you think, can you give me a couple of examples specifically about how the risk assessment has changed from shuttle era um, to what you all are working now with um, SpaceX and Boeing in the commercial crew program? I, I think, uh, first of all, it, it starts um, just with the design of the vehicle and, and what, uh, what they each were made for. Uh, when you look at the space shuttle, uh, it, was, it was made for a, a, a kind of a different purpose in, in terms of it was made to, build, to help build the space station, for example. And, and so based on that, um, how it was built and, and, and all of that uh, uh, put different risks, I would say, with, with flying on the space shuttle. Uh, versus with with these vehicles, uh, the you know what you see with SpaceX, what you see being developed for Boeing, they have a a much smaller mission set, if you will. Um, they are are being made to take uh, people to low Earth orbit to the International Space Station and bring them back, and and so they're not they're not being asked to do uh, the same types of things that uh, the space shuttle was asked to do, and so because of that, I think you'll you'll find that uh, the the risk um, is a little bit different, and I would also say. Uh, that you know we've got the advantage of uh, what 40 years, 50 years since the, the designs of the space shuttle, and so obviously we've we've learned um, a lot from the space shuttle experience, and we've applied those uh, to to these vehicles. And and you can see it. You know earlier we got asked about the TPS issue. All of that experience from the shuttle is being applied right now uh, to this vehicle, and we're and we're taking advantage of that. And so that's not only making it safer for us, but uh, as we as we look at uh, potentially other folks being able to fly on these vehicles, it's making it safer for them as well. And having the, the 20 years of human presence in low Earth orbit has given us the time to work out the operations, mm -hmm. the technology, and, and, and the teamwork, really, the partnership, the 15 to 18 nations that, that uh, make it possible for us to have this International Space Station. So that's also grown our abilities to, to work and live in space. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to Mary Lou Bender with Cosmic Perspective. Hi, thank you. This is Mary Liz. Um, so lately I've been talking to retired astronaut Nicole Stott about a subject near and dear to her. She says that she's always so grateful that someone insisted that she take her humanity with her on her human space flight. And for her, that meant painting in space. And I'm curious what this might mean for you all. Have you decided to bring something special in your personal effects, or have you thought about how you'll spend your personal time? Good question. Yes. For me, yes, <laughs> yes, uh, and uh, yes, we know and love Nicole. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the same talents as she has when it comes to art, so I that is not something I will probably be doing very much of in space. Um, I think a lot of my time will um, be similar to what it was before when I had free time, looking out the window and enjoying the perspectives of space and then thinking of ways that we can um, communicate that to the rest of the world because communicating what we're doing and our experiences up there is hugely important. All right, let's go to Frida Juarez with El Universal again. Yeah, uh, I also wanted to ask, um, sorry, I don't know, um, sorry. So, could you explain me how different it was working? You all, except from Victor, have experience working at NASA, no? Uh, but how does the collaboration with the SpaceX made, made it different? So working, I think you're asking how uh, the experience has been working with SpaceX, different from maybe working at NASA? Yeah. Yeah, you know, that team is, is really amazing, and I, I can't give them enough kudos. Um, it has made me appreciate uh, how hard they work and, and how talented their workforce really is. Every time we go there, I learn a ton. And I, but I also have fun. I, we'll get back to uh, to our, our house in the evening and just be mentally exhausted, maybe physically exhausted. And then we'll sit around at dinner talking about how much we learned, but we'll all have smiles on our faces. And I think the, the NASA culture has been improved by working with SpaceX. And I think SpaceX's culture has been improved by working with NASA. They appreciate different things about us, having all of that experience Mike and Shannon talked about earlier. And we appreciate their talent and their, their uh, operations tempo. Uh, they move pretty fast. And so they do things that, are, that seem to us to be pretty amazing. Uh, but they, they, they do that with a lot of talent and professionalism. 
And I, I would add to that that it, it, in some ways it's very interesting and similar to um, our international partnership when we first started. Our, our international partners all came with their own experiences and approaches and, and ways of doing business, and we've all come together sort of in the center of having one very functional group working together, and so now we're bringing SpaceX into the team, and we're learning from SpaceX, and SpaceX is learning from the partnership. So it's a, it's a very interesting process. All right, let's go back to Celan Barber with Gannett Publications. Great, thank you so much, Megan. Um, I haven't heard as much about the scientific experiments that you might be maintaining or are um, conducting while upon the ISS. Would any of you like to share what uh, science experiments you're going to be working on? Well. So I think a part of that is with the, the flexibility we've had to maintain for launch dates, it means that the, the experiments that are going to be up there while we're there uh, could vary. And so we've had to train on, on a variety of them. And one that I'm really looking forward to is food physiology <laughs> because I love to eat, and it's going to allow me to eat more fruits and vegetables uh, as they try to you know, increase the amount of uh, omega fatty acids and lycopene and flavonoids to see how it affects your, your, your gut health and your immune system and your overall nutrition. So. I'm looking forward to, to food physiology. <laughs> All right, anyone else on science experiments? Well, I got maybe add some. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, we have a variety of science experiments which didn't exist uh, 10 years ago when Shannon and I flew. So uh, right now we have a lot of uh, new, uh, uh, new teams like uh, biotechnology and gene technology. And also we are doing a lot of uh, microsat deployment. Uh, we're using uh, our Kibo, Airlock, which did not exist 10 years ago. So uh, we have a lot of uh, new ways to explore the, the science these days. All right, thanks. Great question. Um, just a reminder, if you have a question on the phone, you can press star one to ask your question or star two to withdraw your question. All right, let's take a couple of more questions from social media. Margaret on Facebook wants to know about your patch. What are the symbols in the patch? What does it stand for? So the uh, symbols on the on the bottom of the patch on that border um, that are that are kind of the shadow symbols uh, they represent the previous U.S. launch vehicles and so that's the uh, the Mercury the Gemini the Apollo and then you'll see the shuttle symbol there and of course that's them flowing into the Crew Dragon and if you look uh, above the head of the of the Dragon in the background you'll see the the outline of the International Space Station which is our destination right now. All right, another question from the SpaceX Reddit group on Twitter. Can astronauts customize their suit and helmet colors? Soichi Noguchi had a cool black helmet in training. <laughs> <laughs> well, the short answer is we wish, but not actually. Guys, that one of the, yeah, I actually like the, those black helmets. So I put it on my Twitter, but uh, that's not the official flight uh, helmet. The SpaceX has a nice, uh, nice design scheme, and it's really actually nice a white helmet. And I don't think we have luxury of changing the spacesuit in any actually shuttle Soyuz. And uh, but uh, the spacesuit actually looks really fantastic. All right, um, let's go to Jeff on Facebook. Are there any fun Easter eggs on Crew Dragon that you know of, or fun features people might not know about? Um, we would we would love to know if there's some fun Easter eggs out there. Uh, I don't I don't I don't know. I'm not aware of any. I might be aware of some, but I'm not going to share them right now. Oh man, uh, you're uh, holding out on us. I, I am. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And for our final question for today, um, let's go to um, Mary on Twitter. What do you, as astronauts, consider a personal goal during the Crew-1 mission? Maybe each of you can um, give a brief answer here. So, you know, as a personal goal, I think um, this one is, is probably fairly obvious, but for all of us, it's to land safely and return to our families. Um, and, and that's kind of first, first and foremost. Uh, I, I think one of my other goals is um, I'm very excited to uh, fly with with Victor on his on his first flight, and um, you know part of that goal then is is uh, looking forward to uh, seeing what he does uh, on his next flight. You know I've listened to the advice of of my colleagues and, and good friends, and and I'm going to make a point to try and and capture the moments. Take. A lot of pictures of the things that we do inside, not just our beautiful planet, but, but also of my crewmates as well to try and really capture that experience, but also just to experience it itself. 
Victor's goal is very similar to my goal. Um, you know, we've we've worked very hard to get to this position. We know we've got a lot of hard work ahead of us on the space station, so we want to accomplish our work, but still have a lot of fun doing it. So if we can come back as a happy crew, like uh, we're going into space, as that's going to be a, a good a good thing. I would say, I would say every day is a new day in space. Enjoy every moment. Return home with a smile. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you all so much for joining us today and for taking questions. Um, we are so excited to see you launch on October 31st. Um, you can watch these guys launch on NASA TV, online at nasa.gov slash live, or on Facebook Live on the NASA Facebook page. You can also join Mike, Victor, and Shannon tomorrow at 10.15 a.m. Eastern Time on Instagram Live on the NASA Instagram page. Um, and you can follow updates on social media by following NASA, the Space Station Commercial Crew, and also um, Victor, Mike, and Suichi on Twitter. Good luck, guys, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, everyone.